Now, I mentioned our patrons earlier on, and uh, we thank them again for their support of the Space Nuts podcast financially. If you'd like to become a patron, go to our website, spacenutspodcast.com, and click on the supporter button and find out how you can become a supporter of the Space Nuts podcast. We're still working on uh, ways to reward our patrons, and some new ideas are being tossed around as I speak, but uh, we are going to, um, to be providing some bonus material uh, in the next uh, little while for our patrons. Uh, we've been uh, a little bit lax lately in keeping up with the, uh, the support of patrons, so we'll, we'll fix that. Uh, and thanks again for, um, for supporting us and, and being a, a patron. We so much appreciate that you're willing to put a few bucks in to the kitty, so uh, thank you again. Now, Fred, time to answer some questions. Uh, we are going to hear from one of our regulars, the astute uh, and incorrigible <laughs> Rusty from Donnybrook, who, uh, well, he can, he can tell you what he's uh, hoping to ask us this week. Hey, Fred and Andrew, it's Rusty in Donnybrook, still hungering for more detail in the big picture, and your show just fits the bill so well. Question for the day, what is the great attractor? Where is it? And will it affect our distant descendants? Mm, okay, thank you, Rusty. Lovely to hear your voice again. Uh, you mind if I have a, a crack at this one first, Fred? Yeah, I think you better do uh, it, yeah. The great attractor <laughs> is the John Deere. I hear it's a superior tractor to most others. So... <laughs> Got a feeling that's go. wrong. <laughs> well, it's better than the less attractive, isn't it? Which is the, uh, the the old Ferguson that we used to see. Oh, the Massey Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah, my yeah. Um, my great uncle was a uh, attractor mechanic back in the day, and they specialised <laughs> in Massey Fergusons. So uh, he also used to fix my car, which he had to do a lot. But uh, yes, <laughs> but that's not the point. We want to find out about the great attractor. What is it? Where is it? Yes, so it's two separate words, different from the great attractor. <laughs> it's the great attractor. And uh, yeah, this is uh, something we've known about, I guess, for 30 or 40 years now. Um, certainly, most of my career, I've been uh, aware of this anomaly, which is basically what it is. Uh, so uh, it, it comes about because um, if you look at I suppose we're talking about relatively nearby galaxies within maybe within a billion light years. OK, that's uh, a billion light years is a long way. But um, within that region, there are lots and lots of galaxies. Um, uh, and it it turns out that, OK, when you observe them and observe their velocities, they, uh, of course, are uh, their movement is primarily dictated by the Hubble flow, uh, the expansion of the universe. And the Hubble flow is what carries galaxies faster away from us the further away they are. We, we understand that because it's the way the universe behaves. Mm. So the Hubble flow is the first thing that you observe. But if you look in detail at these galaxies, you find, well, they have what we call peculiar motions um, and a peculiar velocity as we usually call it is uh it's basically the the it, it's a velocity superimposed on the hubble flow if i can put it that way uh the best way to think of this andrew is the old analogy of of a river flowing uh and carrying boats with yep. it but all the boats are rowing away so they've all got their own motion but that's superimposed on top of the flow of the river and that's what peculiar velocities are in space so these galaxies all have their own motion, which is superimposed on the Hubble flow. So you understand the Hubble flow, you can deal with that. That's yep. the expansion of the universe. But when you've dealt with it, you've still got all these peculiar velocities. They, they've got their individual velocities. And what uh, suggested the great attractor is that these peculiar velocities for a, a very large group of nearby galaxies are all in one direction. Um, and the idea is that these velocities result from the fact that the galaxies are being drawn towards something called the Great Attractor, which is a gravitational mass. And it's it, almost certainly a cluster of galaxies, a large, probably a supercluster, actually. Mm. Uh, but the problem is, 
it's behind the Milky Way. That's why it's always such an interesting thing to talk about because uh, it's hidden from us by the the fact that we are looking, the, the direction in which it is, is behind, it's in the plane of the Milky Way. So it's not actually that far from the, uh, the direction of the galactic center, mm. which is Sagittarius. I think I could probably say um, just where, I think it's in uh, the constellation of Norma, the great attractor, which is one of the, <coughs> excuse me, one of the um, Milky Way plane, galactic plane constellations. So really, uh, a really interesting uh, feature of the universe, which has been discovered by astronomers carefully observing the velocities of galaxies. And their peculiar velocities range over quite a large set of values from about seven, positive 700 kilometers per second to negative 700 kilometers per second. So a range of around about 1400 kilometers per second. And it depends on where you are, you know, in the sky. The, uh, the, you'd, as you'd expect, the I think the ones closer to the Great Attractor are probably moving faster than the ones away, yeah. uh, further away. So uh, you can do all these calculations. Um, the second part of Rusty's question uh, about will it have an effect on our distant descendants? Probably not, mm. <laughs> um, because we know um, even I mean the first thing that's going to happen uh, in this sphere of understanding to our distant descendants is they're going to witness the collision between the Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy which is 4.5 billion years yeah. away so they are very distant descendants and that will probably you know it might trigger some local star formation a few super, supernova explosions and if they're nearby they'll be a bad thing but in general it's not going to uh, really be much of a threat to the solar system unless you get a nearby supernova, which would be. Mm. So um, uh, the gr colliding, you know, being drawn towards the great attractor, which we undoubtedly are uh, in our galaxy, along with the rest of the local group, which includes Andromeda, the Triangulum galaxies, the Magellanic clouds, all of that stuff. Um, w uh, even, even if we collide with the great attractor, it probably won't make much difference to what's going on in our own galaxy. There you go. Mm. Uh, of course, that's all going to take a long time and we're just assuming that <laughs> yeah. humanity will sort out all its differences and live happily ever after and be around of them. Of course, yes. But, yes. yeah, I've got a feeling we might run into a few s snafus before then, but uh, hopefully not. Uh, but thanks, Rusty. Great to hear your voice again. Let's move on uh, to the next question. Hello, Fred and Andrew. This is Dila from Toronto, Canada. I'm a big fan of the show. Well, that's the first one I've heard of. I've um, uh, been listening since day one. Oh, fantastic. Good on you. Uh, I've been meaning to ask a question, but I've always delayed it. And now I've got a whole pile of questions stacked in my brain, but we'll spare you and ask only 18. No, three. Um, <laughs> what makes Neptune invisible to the naked eye? How do they steer space shuttles in the vacuum of space? It's a steering wheel. And uh, what is the universe expanding into? Thank you. You guys are amazing. By far the best duo out there. Keep it up and stay safe down there, down under in Australia, mate. Yes, we will. Thank you, Dila. Um, what makes Neptune invisible to the naked eye, Fred? You've written about Neptune. Uh, yeah, I have, yes. <laughs> um, and it, So ne Neptune's an interesting world. It was um, the, f the first... Uh, probably not quite true actually but um following the discovery of uranus back in uh in 17 uh gosh 1781 i think it was uh 13th of march if i remember rightly um 1781 discovery of uranus people observed uranus and realized that it was not behaving in a way that uh, was, could be understood if the, all that you could see in the solar system was all that there was something was pulling it gravitationally out of its course and uh, mathematicians got hold of that and in 1846 a prediction was made that said look here for Neptune and you'll find it and sure enough uh, that's what happened mm. I think it was Gal uh, was it Galle the German astronomer who um, found it I should know the details of all this because I've been writing about it but never mind um, so the, the, that suggests of course that Neptune is not ne visible to the naked eye uh, because otherwise like Uranus uh, like Saturn and Jupiter it would have been known since ancient times 
Um, and the reason is it's so far away. It's by far the, well, it's the, the most distant planet in the solar system. Uh, an object a bit smaller than Uranus, which is only just visible to the naked eye at certain times uh, and very much nearer than Neptune. Uh, so that's the bottom line. It's just too far away and, uh, and, and too small to be visible with the naked eye. Of course, you can see it with telescopes. We've got lots of telescope images of it, but not. Uh, not naked eye visibility. Mm. Um, how do they steer space shuttles in the vacuum of space? Good question. And that's a really good question because when we think of aircraft, we're, we think of control surfaces which, uh, you know, bite into the air and, and steer the aircraft round. Um, you do you do it with thrusters. In fact, you you use um, little rocket motors uh, which don't need air. Uh, to push against a lot of people think rockets work by pushing against the air mm. that's in the you know in the atmosphere but of course they work in the vacuum of space and it's because um, the, the bottom line with, with a rocket motor is what you've got is a essentially a, um, a, a, a spherical chamber with a hole at one end um, and if you think of it you know there's basically pressure inside it so the pressure is acting it's balanced everywhere in the chamber uh, the pressure on one side is balanced by the pressure on the other side except the side opposite the hole because where where the rocket exhaust escapes from the nozzle at the at one end you've got an unbalanced pressure in the opposite direction um, because the, the the pressure you know that you're not looking at a solid object and it's that unbalanced pressure that forms the thrust of the rocket that's what sends it off in its direction i've drawn a cartoon on this idea oh, from in the new kids book yeah um, which is one of my favorites in the in the whole book so it, it's, it ex explains exactly this why you don't need air to press against but it's got a few other little um, uh, bells and whistles on it as well and finally uh, what's the universe expanding into big question there and the answer is we don't know um i mean the word universe means everything that you can detect or see mm. and so uh you don't really need to have anything for it to be expanding into because there's nothing else, at least in the traditional sense of a universe. Uh, and so it, it is expanding and we know it's expanding um, and it doesn't have to be expanding into anything else. However, in this era of multiverse ideas, um, some people think that maybe it is expanding into a higher dimension, maybe a fifth dimension or something like that, that you've got. Uh, the expansion taking place in and perhaps other universes existing in that fifth dimension oh boy but that's all really fairly uh you know it, it's it, it's more conjecture than science because we don't have any uh, anything other than people's ideas on this to support the view yeah. um there's not there's, there's no observations yet that support the idea of either uh, a fifth dimension or higher dimensions or um, uh, multiverses. Uh, but I have to say, just coming back to something we talked about a little while ago with the square kilometre array, the idea of new physics popping up out of that mm. is the way we might find out about things like higher dimensional spaces and things of that sort. So that's why this is also exciting. Yeah. Maybe one day we'll be able to ex answer the question with, yes, the universe is expanding into a, a fifth, you know, a fifth dimensional treacle or something like that mm. uh, and give an answer to it. But we can't at the no, moment. No, um, I, I got the feeling we're on the cusp of great discovery. It's just because of our advances in technology and, and the equipment that we can now create and the capabilities we have to put things in certain places in space or on Earth to, to look better out there not to look better but to look better to search better yes we, we may well we can't look better uh, we may well uh, be able to start sort of piecing together more information that will ultimately answer the question i don't think we're going to have a light bulb moment until we're right on top of it but uh yeah, that's probably i think true. we're going to chip away at these things until one day we go oh okay well that makes sense go. it's blamange but um <laughs> <laughs> Until then, it will be a slow, steady race requiring much patience, is my theory. But, uh, Dela, thanks for your questions. They were, uh, they were good. I, I actually didn't really think much about movement of space shuttles until you explained it. Uh, I just thought, you know, you turn the rocket on and it goes. <laughs> it does. Mm. Um, 
Simple. All right. Uh, well, that, that's why it yes. is. <laughs> thank you for your question. Thank you, Rusty. And thank you, everybody. Now, next week is episode 250. 250. Oh, my uh, and now that we've surpassed a million downloads, what we want everyone to do between now and next week is listen to every episode over again <laughs> until you catch up to today's. And then next week we can post two million and something. <laughs> I can't yeah, no, don't worry about that. Um, but 250, so uh, we're going to dedicate it all to questions, Fred? Yeah, I think we should. It's sort of become our thing uh, on round we, figures, hasn't it? It has It yeah. has become our thing. And 250, goodness. Oh, yeah. you don't so we will be answering 250 questions next week, uh, or maybe, you know, eight or ten, if we're lucky. <laughs> but uh, please, if you have a question, uh, you can go to our website, spacenutspodcast.com, click on that little AMA tab up the top, uh, and in there you can, you can either email a question to us or you can record one if you've got a device with a microphone. It's as simple as that. And don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from, whether you're texting or voice questioning us. We would love to hear your voices, of course, but um, we, take, uh, we take questions of all kinds, uh, even emailed ones. Uh, so, yes, next week, 250. And, uh, boy, hasn't that... Yeah, it blows my mind. When we started, we thought we'd get uh, 2.5 episodes in, but we're, 200, we're nearly there, 250. Awesome stuff. Um, but that's where we leave it for another week. Fred, thank you so much for your insightful comment and knowledge and intelligence and uh, for sharing it all with us. We appreciate it. <laughs> it's a great pleasure, Andrew. Always good and um, looking forward to the next one. Indeed. Time. See you then. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here on the Space Nuts podcast. Hello to Hugh in the studio who puts it all together with rubber bands and sticky tape. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you again, and we will catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye. <laughs>